welcome to the Cosmic Egg Stories, today we will be talking about the story of the Book of Thoth. From Kemet, Ancient Egypt Ramesses the Great, King of Egypt, had a son called Sna who was learned in all the ancient writings, and a magician of note. While the other princes spent their days in hunting or in leading their father's armies to guard the distant parts of his empire, Sna was never so happy as when left alone to study. Not only could he read even the most ancient hieroglyphic writings on the temporal walls, but he was a scribe who could write quickly and easily all the many hundreds of signs that go to make up the ancient Egyptian language. Also, he was a magician whom none could surpass, for he had learned his art from the most secret of the ancient writings which even the priests of Amen-Ra, of Tar and Thoth, could not read. One day, as he pored over the ancient books written on the two sides of long rolls of papyrus, he came upon the story of another king's son several hundred years earlier who had been as great a scribe and as wise a magician as he greater and wiser, indeed, than Phkepta had read the Book of Thoth by which a man might enchant both heaven and earth, and know the language of the birds and beasts. When Sna read further that the Book of Thoth had been buried with Phkepta in his royal tomb at Memphis, nothing would content him until he had found it and learned all his wisdom. So he sought out his brother Enru and said to him, help me to find the Book of Thoth. For without it life has no longer any meaning for me. I will go with you and stand by your side through all dangers, answered Enru. The two brothers set out for Memphis, and it was not hard for them to find the tomb of Mphkepta the son of Amenhotep, the first great king of that name, who had reigned three hundred years before their day. When Sna had made his way into the tomb, to the central chamber where Mphkepta was laid to rest, he found the body of the prince lying wrapped in its linen bands, still and awful in death. But beside it on the stone sarcophagus sat two ghostly figures, the cas, or doubles, of a beautiful young woman and a boy, and between them, on the dead breast of Nfkepta lay the Book of Thoth. Sna bowed reverently to the two cas, and said, May Osiris have you in his keeping, dead son of a dead king, Nfkepta the great scribe. And you also, whoever you be, Whose cas sit here beside him? Know that I am Sna, the priest of Ta, son of Ramesses the greatest king of all, and I come for the book of Thoth which was yours in your days on earth. I beg you to let me take it in peace, for if not I have the power to take it by force or magic. Then said the car of the woman, Do not take the book of Thoth, Sna, son of today's king. It will bring you trouble even as it brought trouble upon Phkepta who lies here, and upon me, Ura his wife. Hugh's body lies at Coptos on the edge of eastern Thebes, together with that of Meribah's son, whose cas you see before you, dwelling with the husband and father whom we loved so dearly. Listen to my tale, and beware. Mfkepta and I were the children of the king Amenhotep and, according to the custom, we became husband and wife, and this son Merib was born to us. Mfkepta cared above all things for the wisdom of the ancients and for the magic that is to be learned from all that is carved on the temporal walls, and within the tombs and pyramids of long dead kings and priests in Saqqara, the city of the dead that is all about us here on the edge of Memphis. One day as he was studying what is carved on the walls in one of the most ancient shrines of the gods, he heard a priest laugh mockingly and say, All that you read there is but worthless. I could tell you where lies the Book of Thoth which the God of Wisdom wrote with his own hand. When you have read its first page you will be able to enchant the heaven and the earth, the abyss, the mountains and the sea. And you shall know what the birds and the beasts and the reptiles are saying. And when you have read the second page your eyes will behold all the secrets of the gods themselves, and read all that is hidden in the stars. Then said Nfkepta to the priest, By the life of the king, tell me what you would have me do for you, and I will do it if only you will tell me where the Book of Thoth is. And the priest answered, If you would learn where it lies, you must first give me a hundred bars of silver for my funeral, and this you orders that when I die my body shall be buried like that of a great king. Phkepta did all that the priest asked. And when he had received the bars of silver, he said, The Book of Thoth lies beneath the middle of the Nile at Coptos, in an iron box. In the iron box is a box of bronze. In the bronze box is a sycamore box. In the sycamore box is an ivory and ebony box. In the ivory and ebony box is a silver box. In the silver box is a golden box, 
and in that lies the Book of Thoth. All around the iron box are twisted snakes and scorpions, and it is guarded by a serpent who cannot be slain. Mfkepta was beside himself with joy, he hastened home from the shrine and told me all that he had learned. But I feared lest evil should come of it, and said to him, Do not go to Koptos to seek this book, for I know that it will bring great sorrow to you and to those you love. I tried in vain to hold Mfkepta back, but he shook me off and went to the king, our royal father, and told him what he had learned from the priest. Then said King, What is it that you desire? And Nthkepta answered, Bid your servants make ready the royal boat, for I would sail south to Koptos with Ira my wife and our son Merib. To seek this book without delay. All was done as he wished, and we sailed up the Nile until we came to Koptos. And there the priests and priestesses of Isis came to welcome us and led us up to the temple of Isis and Horus. Nthkepta made a great sacrifice of an ox, a goose and some wine, and we feasted with the priests and their wives in a fine house looking out upon the river. But on the morning of the fifth day, leaving me and Merib to watch from the window of the house, Nfkepta went down to the river and made a great enchantment. First he created a magic cabin that was full of men and tackle. He cast a spell on it, giving life and breath to the men, and he sank the magic cabin into the river. Then he filled the royal boat with sand and put out into the middle of the Nile until he came to the place below which the magic cabin lay. And he spoke words of power, and cried, Work men, work men, work for me even where lies the Book of Thoth. They toiled without ceasing by day and by night, and on the third day they reached the place where the book lay, then kept to cast out the sand and they raised the book on it until it stood upon a shoal above the level of the river. And behold all about the iron box, below it and above it, snakes and scorpions twined. And the serpent that could not die was twined about the box itself. Nfkepta cried to the snakes and scorpions a loud and terrible cry, and at his words of magic they became still, nor could one of them move. Then Nfkepta walked unharmed among the snakes and scorpions until he came to where the serpent that could not die lay curled around the box of iron. The serpent reared itself up for battle, since no charm could work on it, and Nfkepta drew his sword and rushing upon it, smote off its head at a single blow. But at once the head and the body sprang together, and the serpent that could not die was whole again and ready for the fray. Once more Nfkepta smote off its head, and this time he cast it far away into the river. But at once the head returned to the body, and was joined to the neck, and the serpent that could not die was ready for its next battle in Fkepta. Saw that the serpent could not be slain, but must be overcome by cunning. So once more he struck off its head. But before head and body could come together he put sand on each part so that when they tried to join they could not do so as there was sand between them, and the serpent that could not die lay helpless in two pieces. Then Kepta went to where the iron box lay on the shoal in the river. And the snakes and scorpions watched him. And the head of the serpent that could not die watched him also, but none of them could harm him. He opened the iron box and found in it a bronze box. He opened the bronze box and found in it a box of sycamore wood. He opened that and found a box of ivory and ebony, and in that a box of silver, and at the last a box of gold. And when he had opened the golden box he found in it the Book of Thoth. He opened the book and read the first page, and at once he had power over the heavens and the earth, the abyss, the mountains and the sea. He knew what the birds and the beasts and the fishes were saying. He read the next page of spells, and saw the sun shining in the sky, the moon and the stars, and knew their secrets. And he saw also the gods themselves who are hidden from mortal sight. Then, rejoicing that the priest's words had proved true, and the Book of Thought was his, he cast a spell upon the magic men, saying, Work men, work men, work for me and take me back to the place from which I came. They brought him back to Coptos where I sat waiting for him taking neither food nor drink in my anxiety, but sitting stark and still like one who is gone to the grave. When Fkepta came to me, he held out the Book of Thoth and I took it in my hands, and when I read the first page I also had power over the heavens and the earth, the abyss, the mountains and the sea. And I also knew what the birds, the beasts and the fishes were saying. And when I read the second page I saw the sun, the moon and the stars with all the gods, 
and knew their secrets even as he did. Then Vkepta took a clean piece of papyrus and wrote on it all the spells from the Book of Thoth. He took a cup of beer and washed off the words into it and drank it so that the knowledge of the spells entered into his being. But I, who cannot write, do not remember all that is written in the Book of Thoth, for the spells which I had read in it were many and hard. After this we entered the royal boat and set sail for Memphis. But scarcely had we begun to move, when a sudden power seemed to seize our little boy Merib so that he was drawn into the river and sank out of sight. Seizing the Book of Thoth, Nf kept to read from it the necessary spell, and at once the body of Merib rose to the surface of the river and we lifted it on board. But not all the magic in the book, not that of any magician in Egypt, could bring Merib back to life. Nonetheless Nfkepta was able to make his car speak to us and tell us what had caused his death. And the car of Merib said, Thoth the great god found that his book had been taken, and he hastened before Amun-Ra, saying, Nfkepta, son of King Amun-Hope, has found my magic box and slain its guards and taken my book with all the magic that is in it. And Ra replied to him, Deal with Nfkepta and all that is his as it seems good to you. I send out my power to work sorrow and bring a punishment upon him and upon his wife and child. And that power from Ra, passing through the will of Thoth, drew me into the river and drowned me. Then we made great lamentation, for our hearts were well nigh broken at the death of Merib. We put back to shore at Koptos, and there his body was embalmed and laid in a tomb as befitted him. When the rites of burial and the lamentations for the dead were ended, Nfkepta said to me, let us now sail with all haste down to Memphis to tell our father the king what has chanced. For his heart will be heavy at the death of Merib. Yet he will rejoice that I have the Book of Thoth. So we set sail once more in the royal boat. But when it came to the place where Merib had fallen into the water, the power of Ra came upon me also and I walked out of the cabin and fell into the river and was drowned. And when Vkepta by his magic arts had raised my body out of the river, and my car had told him all, he turned back to Coptos and had my body embalmed and laid in the tomb beside Merib. Then he set out once more in bitter sorrow for Memphis. But when it reached that city, and Pharaoh came aboard the royal boat, it was to find Vkepta lying dead in the cabin, with the Book of Thoth bound upon his breast. So there was mourning throughout all the land of Egypt, and Nfkepta was buried with all the rites and honors due to the son of Pharaoh in this tomb where he now lies, and where my car and the car of Merib come to watch over him. And now I have told you all the woe that has befallen us because we took and read the Book of Thoth, the book which you ask us to give up. It is not yours, you have no claim to it, indeed for the sake of it we gave up our lives on earth when. Sna had listened to all the tale told by the car of Ira. He was filled with awe. But nevertheless the desire to have the Book of Thoth was so strong upon him that he said, Give me that which lies upon the dead breast of Nfkepta, or I will take it by force. Then the Kazavira and Merib drew away as if in fear of Sna the great magician. But the car of Nfkepta arose from out of his body and stepped towards him, saying, Sna, if after hearing all the tale which Ura my wife has told you, yet you will take no warning, then the Book of Thoth must be yours. But first you must win it from me, if your skill is great enough. By playing a game of drafts with me, a game of fifty-two points. Dare you do this? And Sna answered, I am ready to play. So the board was set between them, and the game began. And Nfkepta won the first game from Sna, and put his spell upon him so that he sank into the ground to above the ankles. And when he won the second game, Sna sank to his waist in the ground. Once more they played and when Nfkepta once Sna sank in the ground until only his head was visible. But he cried out to his brother who stood outside the tomb. Amru. Make haste. Run to the king and beg of him the great amulet of Tur, for by it only can I be saved, if you set it upon my head before the last game is played and lost. So Amru sped down the steep road from Saqqara to where the king sat in his palace at Memphis. And when he heard all, he fastened into the temple of Tur, took the great amulet from its place in the sanctuary, and gave it to Enru, saying, Go with all speed, my son, and rescue your brother Sna from this evil contest with the dead. Back to the tomb sped Enru.
and down through the passages to the tomb chamber where the car of Mfkepta still played at drafts with Sna. And as he entered, Sna made his last move, and Mfkepta reached out his hand with a cry of triumph to make the final move that should win the game and sink Sna out of sight beneath the ground forever. But before Mfkepta could move the piece, Ainri leapt forward and placed the amulet of Tar on Sna's head. And at its touch Sna sprang out of the ground, snatched the Book of Thoth from Mfkepta's body and fled with Ainru from the tomb. As they went they heard the car of Ura cry, Alas, all power is gone from him who lies in this tomb. But the car of Mfkepta answered, Be not sad, I will make Sna bring back the Book of Thoth and come as a suppliant to my tomb with a forked stick in his hand and a fire pan on his head. Then Sna and Ainru were outside, and at once the tomb closed behind them and seemed as if it had never been opened. When Sna stood before his father the great king and told him all that had happened, and gave him the amulet of Tur, Ramesses said, My son, I counsel you to take back the Book of Thoth to the tomb of Mfkepta like a wise and prudent man for otherwise be sure that he will bring sorrow and evil upon you, and at the last you will be forced to carry it back as a suppliant with a forked stick in your hand and a fire pan on your head. But Sna would not listen to such advice. Instead, he returned to his own dwelling and spent all his time reading the Book of Thoth and studying all the spells contained in it. And often he would carry it into the Temple of Tar and read from it to those who sought his wisdom. One day as he sat in a shady colonnade of the temple he saw a maiden, more beautiful than any he had ever seen, entering the temple with fifty-two girls in attendance on her. Sna gazed fascinated at this lovely creature with her golden girdle and headdress of gold and colored jewels, who knelt to make her offerings before the statue of Ta. Soon he learned that she was called Tapua, and was the daughter of the high priest of the cat goddess based it from the city of Bibastis to the north of Memphis. Based it who was the bride of the god Tar of Memphis. As soon as Sna beheld Tapua, it seemed as if Hatha the goddess of love had cast a spell over him. He forgot all else, even the Book of Thoth, and desired only to win her. And it did not seem as if his suit would be in vain, for when he sent a message to her, she replied that if he wished to seek her, he was free to do so, provided he came secretly to her palace in the desert outside Bibastis. Sna made his way thither in haste, and found a pylon tower in a great garden with a high wall round about it. There Tapua welcomed him with sweet words and looks, led him to her chamber in the pylon and served him with wine in a golden cup. When he spoke to her of his love, she answered, Be joyful, my sweet lord, for I am destined to be your bride. But remember that I am no common woman but the child of Bastet the Beautiful, and I cannot endure a rival. So before we are wed write me a scroll of divorcement against your present wife. And write also that you give your children to me to be slain and thrown down to the cats of Bastet, for I cannot endure that they shall live and perhaps plot evil against our children. Be it as you wish. Cried Sna. And straightway he took his brush and wrote that Tapua might cast his wife out to starve and slay his children to feed the sacred cats of Bastet. And when he had done this, she handed him the cup once more and stood before him in all her loveliness, singing a bridal hymn. Presently terrible cries came floating up to the high window of the pylon, the dying cries of his children, for he recognized each voice as it called to him in agony and then was still. But Sna drained the golden cup and turned to Tapua, saying, My wife is a beggar and my children lie dead at the pylon foot. I have nothing left in the world but you, and I would give all again for you. Come to me, my love. Then Tapua came towards him with outstretched arms, more lovely and desirable than Hatha herself. With a cry of ecstasy, Sna caught her to him, and as he did so, on a sudden she changed and faded until his arms held a hideous, withered corpse. Sna cried aloud in terror, and as he did so, the darkness swelled around him, the pylon seemed to crumble away, and when he regained his senses he found himself lying naked in the desert beside the road that led from Bibastis to Memphis. The passers-by on the road mocked at Sna. But one kinder than the rest threw him an old cloak, and with this about him he came back to Memphis like a beggar. When he reached his own dwelling place and found his wife and children there alive and well, he had but one thought and that was to return the Book of Thoth and Fkepta. If Tapua and all her sorcerers were but a dream, 
he exclaimed, they show me in what terrible danger I stand. For if such another spell is cast upon me, next time it will prove to be no dream. So, with the Book of Thoth in his hands, he went before the king his father and told him what had happened. And Ramesses the Great said to him, Sna, what I warned you of has come to pass. You would have done better to obey my wishes sooner. Nfkepta will certainly kill you if you do not take back the Book of Thoth to where you found it. Therefore go to the tomb as a suppliant, carrying a forked stick in your hand and a fire pan on your head. Sna did as the king advised. When he came to the tomb and spoke the spell, it opened to him as before, and he went down to the tomb chamber and found Nthkepta. Lying in his sarcophagus with the Kazavira and Merab sitting on either side. And the Kaavira said, Truly it is Ta, the great god, who has saved you and made it possible for you to return here as a suppliant. Then the Ka of Nthkepta rose from the body and laughed, saying, I told you that you would return as a suppliant, bringing the Book of Thoth. Place it now upon my body where it lay these many years. But do not think that you are yet free of my vengeance. Unless you perform that which I bid you, the dream of Tapua will be turned into reality. Then said Sna, bowing low, Nfkepta, master of magic, tell me what I may do to turn away your just vengeance. If it be such as a man may perform, I will do it for you. I ask only a little thing, answered the car of Nfkepta. You know that while my body lies here for you to see, the bodies of Ura and Mera breast in their two Makoptos. Bring their bodies here to rest with mine until the day of awakening when Osiris returns to earth, for we love one another and would not be parked then. Snow went in haste to the king and begged for the use of the royal boat. And the king was pleased to give command that it should sail with Snow where he would. So Snow voyaged up the Nile to Koptos. And there he made a great sacrifice to Isis and Horus, and begged the priests of the temple to tell him where Ora and Merib lay buried. But, though they searched the ancient writings in the temple, they could find no record. Snow was in despair. But he offered a great reward to any who could help him, and presently a very old man came tottering up to the temple and said, If you are Snow the great scribe, come with me. For when I was a little child my grandfather's father who was as old as I am now told me that when he was even as I was then his grandfather's father had shown him where Ora and Merib lay buried, for as a young man in the days of King the I he had helped to lay them in the tomb. Sna followed eagerly where the old man led him, and came to a house on the edge of Koptos. You must pull down this house and dig beneath it, said the old man. And when Sna had bought the house for a great sum from the scribe who lived in it, he bade the soldiers whom the king had sent with him level the house with the ground and dig beneath where it had stood. They did as he bade them, and presently came to a tomb buried beneath the sand and cut from the rock. And in it lay the bodies of Ura and Merib. When he saw them, the old man raised his arms and cried aloud. And as he cried he faded from sight and Sna knew that it was the car of Mfkepta which had taken on that shape to lead him to the tomb. So he took up the mummies of Ura and Merib and conveyed them with all honour, as if they had been the bodies of a queen and prince of Egypt, down the Nile in the royal boat to Memphis. And there the king himself led the funeral procession to Saqqara, and Sna placed the bodies of Ura and Merib beside that of Mfkepta in the secret tomb where lay the Book of Thoth. When the funeral procession had left the tomb, Sna spoke a charm and the wall closed behind him leaving no trace of a door. Then at the king's command they heaped sand over the low stone shrine where the entrance to the tomb was hidden. And before long a sandstorm turned it into a great mound, and then leveled it out so that never again could anyone find a trace of the tomb when kept lay with Ura and Merib and the Book of Thoth, waiting for the day of awakening when Osiris shall return to rule over the earth. That's all for today, stay tuned for more and thank you for watching.